Esther Hoyer on behalf of the Support Center for Data Sharing. Support Center for Data Sharing is an initiative funded by the European Commission that facilitates data sharing. That is transactions in which uh, data that is held either in the public or private sector are made available through organizations um, for use and reuse. And we do so by researching, documenting and showcasing best practices across the EU, legal frameworks and technical tools. And today we are joined by Miko, which is an Australian born company that provides a platform for people as well as organizations uh, to make the best use of data, um, personal data in this regard. Um, we are joined by Katrina Dow and J Jason Smith. Um, and I would like to give the floor to you, Katrina, to introduce yourself and the company. Thank you, Raymond. And um, uh, I'm pleased to say that whilst the company started in Australia, um, we very quickly became uh, a global global company with um, uh, an office in London, first of all, and then followed by uh, an office and a company incorporated in Belgium. So we're also a European company. Um, uh, so the move into Europe was was very much accelerated by the fact that in terms of data sharing and regulation and maturity of thinking, at both a regulatory and a commercial level, I think is, is really very much being um, uh, led through the, the EU in particular. Can you tell me how the idea of Miko was conceived? Sure. Um, so uh, it was conceived by being inspired by a movie, to be, to be honest. Um, so uh, I'm quite a sci-fi fan, and um, it was actually the film Minority Report that I saw in 2002. And uh, whilst I was really excited by lots of the really kind of cool things, um, what really also stood out was that we were heading towards this amazing data-connected society, as it was portrayed in the film, um, but there were also uh, many aspects of it that were super creepy. Um, and if, if anyone listening or watching remembers that film, um, we, we had got to the stage where we were using data to um, read people's thoughts before they took any action. So it wasn't, it wasn't just kind of tracking data externally, it was tracking data internally. Um, so the things that inspired about that uh, film were obviously, you know, all the special effects and flying cars and all of the amazing things. But the other side of it was that it that it seemed to be portraying a society where there was a lot of digital convenience, but there'd been a real loss of um, autonomy or or human decision making. Um, and that was really what struck me. And I remember leaving the cinema and thinking, wow, you know, I'm inspired and also freaked out. You know, there were things about that that were really creepy and things about it that were really cool. And someone should do something about that. <laughs> um, and I, I remember sort of pushing that to the back of my mind. But over the course of the next decade, between 2002 and 2012, um, that someone and something didn't go away. And um, in early 2012, I wrote a manifesto just looking at what it could mean for us collectively to have digital agency um, in uh, a kind of hyper-connected world. Um, so we'd already seen the uh, creation of the internet, the ability to send email, um, the rise of search engines, the rise of social platforms, and what seemed like the next evol evolution was kind of the sovereignty of the digital self. What would it look like if we also had the same kind of technological agency um, to be part of the value chain? So it was originally kind of more of a a way of organising my thoughts. I'd, I'd been really inspired by a lot of the reports that have come out of the World Economic Forum, um, reports on digital identity, reports on um, uh, shadowing kind of regulation that that eventually became GDPR. I mean, this was this is 2012, um, but the rights of 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 citizens around their digital uh, footprint, privacy, uh, and what originally started as a manifesto eventually soon after became a company and, and that was that was the beginning of Miko or 
the me economy or the me ecosystem, which is where the name comes from. Ah, that's the name. Now I get it. Okay, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so from this, um, from from uh, the regulations at the time, the GDPR and the World Economic Forum, the, those developments there, why would you say um, a need for data sharing came to being? What kind of need does the does Miko fulfill in that regard? So it seemed it seemed obvious at the time reading a lot of those reports that that would be an evolutionary process. I, I'd come from financial services and a strategy background and it seemed the amazing improvements in any kind of value chain enabled by technology. So whether or not that was looking at bank settlement or if that was looking at integration through an insurance value chain, normally it led to better outcomes. So, so that was kind of one thought that had really come from strategy background. But I guess what cemented it for me was around, I think, May 2012, um, uh, Facebook was scheduled to do its initial um, IPO. And um, I had uh, looked in the preceding months, I had looked through their um, public documents uh, for the for the um, the share offer, and I immediately went to the risks to look at what an organisation like that that was signalling the market and trying to raise substantial funding as to what the perceived risks were. And the things that jumped out at me was um, a consideration that people might become concerned about their privacy. Um, that people may become aware of the value of their data, that there may be regulatory changes that could impact the business model. And if you remember at that time in 2012, Facebook was moving from desktop to mobile and the business model, which was really advertising, was going to become much more opaque. It wasn't going to be, you know, there was much less screen to deal with. And so the idea that you would be seeing kind of what was happening um, had to be reduced now to a mobile screen. And so for me at the time, that suggested that if we could um, think of a platform that would enable privacy by design, didn't monetize data, uh, took into account there would be a regulatory framework and had a very transparent business model, that there may be um, a, a point in the future where those risks became a reality and therefore we were we were looking at um, alternatives and we always imagined that by being able to create what we call the API of me the ability to give a citizen a patient a student a customer um, access to be able to collect protect and exchange their data that that could lead to a more meaningful digital economy so again this was before GDPR that was aiming really to step in to protect and also to give um, citizens the ability to collect or access. But the piece that seemed missing from our perspective was the exchange. If we were going to move towards a very digital society, then whilst privacy is paramount and very important, you can't have a digital economy if everyone is locking their entire digital footprint away so they can't transact in a digital way. So our focus was how do you start to build tools that can be used by enterprise or government or startups to make that exchange transparent, equitable, ethical, um, and then focus on better outcomes. And so we realized there were a lot of startups around sort of that time that were thinking, well, if you could get your data back from Facebook, you could back it up and then you could sell it and, you know, you could make um, you know, a small amount of money and, and um, disintermediate kind of that ad model. And our perspective had always been that if we could get directly into the value chain, then what we could um, enable are better outcomes and better decisions. So more personalized health or financial decisions or education or transport, and that would require participation. Um, and for participation to work for all parties, then you, you need to have trust and transparency. And that was really the basis of, of why we developed the platform to enable that exchange. Yeah, yeah, you've mentioned stepping into the value chain and covering uh, the entire process in that regard. Um, 
this kind of ties into uh, my next question. Like, um, what is a data sharing lifecycle, Miko? Where does it start? Where does it end? Where do you get the data? And uh, at which points do you sort of uh, let it venture it out? Um, how does that work? So we, so we talk about collect, protect and exchange. So collect could mean um, you exercising your data rights. So it, it could be that you apply um, in a European context for access to data that's being held. Um, it could be that you are accessing one of our products inside, um, uh, uh, for instance, your mobile banking application. So it could be simply that you're able to collect data that's important to you or that might be pushed to you from um, your bank, say, for instance, under open banking or from your healthcare provider because uh, there is a reciprocal API. So the ability to pull it from a source or receive it from a source and also collect. There's lots of day to day admin jobs that we do every day where we're creating spreadsheets or we're creating notes or where we're actually creating documents or information that's really um, uh, important or could be reusable. And so we imagined the importance of being able to bring it from a source um, by request, um, receive it because it was being pushed to help you uh, with a job to be done, you know, open a bank account, book an airline ticket, or for you to be able to bring it from other parts of your life because it's time to re renew your insurance and, and you actually have the data, the documents, the information that could help you with that decision. Yeah, so from a practical point of view, me as an individual, if I would use your platform, I would have access to, well, for let's say, uh, the data that my insurance uh, collects on me. I could I could see what they have on me. Is that a bit how it works or am I wrong? I think it's good to step back and say, if you were to use our platform, because I think that was one of the big um, insights for us as we started to develop the platform was that initially we were thinking that uh, people were ready for this kind of capability. Um, and I think in many ways, from a privacy point of view, that's true. But the important context around uh, the data economy is that it's actually three layers that, and the technology is probably the easiest part of it. There is always the regulatory or legal environment and then there is the commercial. And I, I, once we started to work with organisations um, around real use cases, we realised that actually rather than having a direct to consumer capability, that we could focus on a platform capability um, that would enable a startup that has a great idea around collecting or protecting data or an enterprise that has a regulatory requirement to offer more transparency that if we focused on a platform of tools um, and capabilities then it would extend uh, the, the use of, of what we were developing but it could also um, enable each of those different sectors, say health, education, travel, retail, for all of those sectors to develop something with some deep subject matter expertise. So the focus for us is, was to, as it is still today, is to look at the tools, the capability, the security, the encryption, the data exchange, the, the emerging standards, the interoperability, the portability, all of those things that are very important for an individual to be able to have and to make that as simple as possible to build new applications. So again, whether or not that's by putting our technology inside an existing portal or app or digital um, interaction, or whether or not it's some wonderful founder that's listening to this, this interview who has a really great idea to solve a problem and help people make better digital decisions. But the cost of getting started with the complexity of data management, the security, all of the, the setup so that you can make those um, promises around transparency and security, that that would be prohibitive, you know. So when I look at what we've invested to develop that, so the idea that that could be a foundation and then what we start to do is what's the job to be done? Um, if you wake up in the morning and there's something you want to do, 
instead of having to decide between a great digital experience that's very convenient or privacy and control, imagine if, if you could have have both, both of them. That's, yeah, exactly. exactly. And that's really where our focus is in, in being able to support that being an and not an or convenience problem solved and the ability to, to have that privacy or control or, or transparency. Yeah, it shouldn't be an either or thing. So yeah. you do, it's great in that regard, it's combining it. Um, in our previous talk, I, I know that you have a wide range of clients. Could you maybe give an example of a use case? Yeah, sure. So I, I will talk briefly around um, some different use cases in different parts of the world. So um, here in Belgium, uh, KBC Bank um, uh, actually has um, a solution powered by Miko inside their mobile banking app. So uh, that's quite simply a digital vault or digital safe that enables customers to collect and protect their data. Um, and what's unique about that is that uh, we never have access to any data that is used through our platform, uh, neither does the bank. Um, and so that is a really fantastic example of um, a privacy and security um, uh, uh, focused initiative for a customer. Um, that, that doesn't mean the customer has to trade off, but has all the convenience of being able to access that environment inside their mobile banking application. That's one example. Another example. So none of their personal data is shared with the bank. So none of their personal data is shared with the bank or with you. It's entirely in their own hands. Yeah. Exactly. So think of it. Think of the exact same paradigm that you imagine for um, the way banks used to. Well still do offer a physical vault or, or a physical form of protection. But more and more as our life moves to digital, then what are the things that we we know we want to be able to um, trust uh, their safekeeping, but we may also want the convenience of everyday access. And, and I think in, in that regard, that's one of the things that um, uh, banks are uniquely positioned to do and in, and in particular I think KBC have demonstrated real market leadership in, in, in taking that initiative for sure. Okay, this is a, an example in the banking world that you mentioned. Um, do you want to talk so, about others? Or? Yeah, so also in Belgium, we'll do Belgium first and then we might jump to Australia. Um, so also in Belgium, um, in the coming weeks we will, uh, we will co-launch um, together with uh, HEDA, um, uh, a children's platform for children, a, a design for children sort of age zero to seven. And uh, it's a media platform to enable children to have access to all different forms of media that has been curated by their parents or their grandparents or their teacher. Um, in a way that is safe and secure. So it uses all of the same underlying technology, the ability to collect, protect, share, exchange. Um, it has parental controls. It has um, a role for um, mediation. So media can be viewed first. And there are two separate applications. Um, and the children's media app is uh, digital uh, and um, supports digital content but not connected to the internet in the same way that you would have um, a product like YouTube, meaning no tracking, no advertising, no algorithms, and no concern on what's going to come up next. And so the idea of that whole media platform is designed for children to, to have a safe environment. Connections are, are moderated through the family. It's a great way to help young parents start to understand how to protect their, their child's digital footprint. And it's also the convenience of something that children can play with and interact with without having to trade off the other things that are a concern. So that's some. Um, uh, that's like a very of, nice initiative also yeah. for, for parents <laughs> to have some kind of control of what their child is seeing, uh, I imagine. Um, if they just go off and wander on the internet, that's uh, for a parent way less concerning um, yeah. than having some sort of control there. And it's also beautiful. So that product is called Mix It um, because the idea is also the child with with at a very relatively young age can mix the media and experience the media in different ways. So we all know that that children have a short 
attention span. So the idea of it being interactive and playful is really important, um, which is why children naturally explore if they're connected to digital tools or they're online. And that exploration can sometimes have a child ending up in a space that a parent doesn't would, would prefer them not to be. So we, we took into account the idea of how do you still allow a child to explore and play, but at the same time, make sure that that is within a safe environment. Then if we, um, if we look to Australia, we're doing some very interesting things um, in the financial services sector, um, and we'll, we'll actually have more to say on that in the, in, I think in the coming weeks. Um, particularly around decentralised uh, identity and working on um, a multi-purpose wallet that supports uh, verified credentials using one of the leading um, standards for verifiable credentials as alongside digital identity and payments. And we will also be supporting a token service and we'll also um, uh, produce a, an SDK and a range of tools so that that actually can um, be supported, uh, can support other applications, including um, uh, another partner in Australia that's building on our platform, Vela Solutions, that is taking that capability and focusing on workforce management. So how can you help um, an employee collect and protect um, the data associated with their employment, um, whether that's onboarding, or whether that's um, uh, being able to prove something around their ability to work with children or um, a police check or um, uh, their education status or specific experience. So when you think of all of the things that you may need when you're applying for a role or if you're working as a consultant to be able to prove that not to your employer, but so that your employer is able to show that within a consulting context. Um, also, the ability for you to have access to say a physical environment based on the role that you're in. So particularly post COVID, we're going to have this new hybrid world of, of um, I'm sure if you're anything like me, you're, you're keen to connect back into the human. Um, yes, very much. <laughs> yeah, and see, and see people again. I, I know I'm, I'm really getting to the point where I'm very tired of my own company. Um, but by the same time- We all time, are, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm super productive. You know, it's this bittersweet, yeah. I mean, you, you can get so much more uh, in your day, um, but at the same time, we're missing a lot of those wonderful opportunities that happen when people are just connected. And so tomorrow's workforce, and by tomorrow I mean, you know, post-summer, I don't mean years away, but the workforce that is emerging um, will be very different. It will be a hybrid. And so who are you? Should you be here in this building, in this place? Are you who I expect you to be? So the idea of being able to trust identity and credentials, um, location, skills, these things are going to become more and more important for us to be able to support in a digital way because the friction that we would put up with in the physical world won't be there. Um, the idea that you might uh, onboard to a company and it might take a couple of weeks to get all that documentation sorted out, but that's okay, come to the office, someone will swipe you in. That's not the case. I mean, we doubled the size of our company last year and and all of the people we hired, i would never met physically before. There was no office for them to come to. So part of our motivation and, and interest in supporting someone like Bella Solutions to bring this to market is it was the same for us. You know, how do you how do you go through that recruitment and onboarding process? And then one more example, which I think is, um, which is a great um, move towards our original vision around life management, digital life management. And I think one of the most um, fantastic examples of that was a company called My Life Capsule, uh, also in Australia. And they're really focusing on um, intergenerational digital life, meaning all the admin tasks associated with 
many different life events, um, some of those life events filled with joy, the birth of a child, and some of those life events very difficult, the loss of a loved one. Um, and it's at those wonderful moments and at those difficult moments that there's often some administration that goes alongside of that, registering a birth, arranging or getting access to a bank account, turning off digital accounts, um, setting things up, being able to make sure that, that in case of an emergency, there is someone that you trust that has access to your information. And um, My Life Capsule is focused on looking at those intergenerational life events and looking at how that digital experience um, can not only be managed, but how you can develop um, a, a trusted circle uh, around the family as to who you would trust, what you would trust them with, and what would be the event that would trigger access to, to the sharing of that information. And in that uh, regard, do you use any specific licensing or legal standards to share data? Does that come into play? Yeah, we do. So, um, so a lot of the the platform um, has been um, developed, uh, you know, developed in house. However, we're very active. When I when I talked a little a few moments ago around the verifiable credentials, we're following the W three C standard. Um, when it comes to a lot of um, ways that we integrate with other um, platforms or the ability to actually get data or um, uh, exchange data, we may be using commonly uh, um, uh, embraced uh, authentication or authorization capabilities. So we're and we're also active in um, different um, community groups around these emerging standards and, and positively and um, uh, let me just say positively. Positively, there are many, many things that are on track in terms of emerging standards in this space. But from a practical point of view, I was reviewing some information that came from one of the working groups over the weekend and, and I see dates 2024, 2025, 2026, wow. 2027. So, so um, so there's a lot of work still to do in that area, um, but I think the positive news is is that again, you know, let's see how what shapes up here in Europe around the Data Governance Act um, and this role of the intermediaries. But that may start to drive some of these practical applications in terms of um, portability and interoperability. Um, and then the other great thing is use cases in particular industry domains. They, they drive the ability to, um, to find common ways to make those things scalable. Um, and, and that's really where our interest is in always looking at, well, what existing technologies could we integrate with? Could we leverage? Um, and, and kind of one of our philosophies has always been, we see this emerging decentralized world with lots of wonderful prom promise with decentralized solutions, whether that's um, um, distributed ledger or blockchain or self-sovereign applications. And then we see the world that we're in now, hospitals and, and uh, airports and border control and banks and insurance companies. And our vision has been to build this tool set that enables both of those worlds actually to coexist and work together. Because it seems like now it's very separate, so uh, the the environments that we live in ourselves are not uh, as self sovereign uh, and decentralized yet. Is that what you're what you're seeing? Uh, I think I think we have a lot of um, you know we we have decentralized. If I I look on my desk right now, I think you know I have my EU and I have my Estonian digital identity card, right? So you know this this physically can prove something. It's in my wallet. I can wander around with it. I can choose to take it out. I can choose to use it. Um, so so there is, um, there, and same with my passport, I could choose to prove something, you know, um, if you didn't recognize it from my accent, um, I could further back it up by showing you my Australian passport. So, so there are things that we have in the physical world um, that, that have a digital equivalent that we use every day and the Australian government doesn't know if I've just shown my passport um, somewhere in a physical place to prove something about myself, you know, my, my date of birth or my citizenship. 
So we're used to that paradigm. Um, and I think what we want to be able to do is to still have some of that freedom and digital agency, but because of this massive acceleration over the last decade in particular around fraud and trust and um, misuse within a digital context, we also want to know if we're relying on that, that we can trust who has issued that information. And I think that's that's the hybrid of these two worlds. It's not either or. It's not saying give me my identity and let me um, be completely autonomous in society. It's saying I want the freedoms I have in the physical world. However, if something um, is really important, I want to know that there is digital infrastructure that will allow my government to say yes, this is who this person is, or this document is valid, or this person is licensed to drive. And so I think when we start to think of that hybrid, that's where we start to see the legal and commercial value for all parties. Then, then, it's, then it's kind of not either or, but, it, but it's a pathway sort of towards that future. Yeah, exactly. And making this possible, legislation obviously has a big role and regulation. Um, you mentioned the, the Data Governance Act already. Um, in that regard, do you think in order to share data properly going forward, do we need more or less regulation? We need different regulation. I mean, look, one of the one of the one of the difficulties is um, uh, uh, was some years ago. I actually met Nigel Cameron, who who lives here in Belgium now, at a conference in Australia, and he was doing some work, uh, I think, um, for a think tank in the US at the time, and he was saying that regulation was tracking around fifteen years behind technological breakthrough, right? Because by the time it takes for us to understand, look at what that means from a strategic point of view, review it against existing regulation. So I think one of the challenges right now is what we can do with technology is moving at a much, much, much faster pace than at either our understanding of it or our ability to think about how we might regulate it, right? And so what we, we have is I don't think it's about more or less. It's about saying, OK, if we imagine if we put ourselves back in the minority report and think, OK, you know, what does the year 2050 look like when everything is connected and we're authenticating every second? You know, the refrigerator recognizes me, the car recognizes me, the street lamp recognizes me. Um, what would that look like? And I and I think the most critical thing that's missing in the same way that human rights were, were missing at a particular time in our societal evolution, is that that digital bill of rights is, is probably what we want to see shaping um, certainly over this next decade. And then what's the legal framework or the regulatory framework that would go around that? Because if we if we don't work this out and, and we have a generation born that is only digital, um, and there isn't that same um, recognition around the rights that we have in the physical world, the ability to close a door or or shut the curtains on a window or or turn something off and have that safe space. If we haven't worked out what those digital equivalents are, then that doesn't make for a very um, healthy or um, safe society. And, I, and so these are, this is why we can invent the technology and then what we may actually need is some regulation to help foster it or protect it. Um, we may come up with legal protections and then we may need regulation that will um, support the, um, encourage <laughs> uh, the carrot and stick for, for its adoption. Um, and and also sometimes on some of these standards, the technology is going to take two, three, four, five years, and it would be an ideal thing to parallel that alongside what the the legal and regulatory environment might be when those breakthroughs are there. Yeah, yeah, I think it, it, it's natural that legislation always comes after the technology has been uh, yeah. has emerged. Um, this is normal, yeah. I guess. Um, and you touched upon your view for the future already a bit. Um, where do you see Miko in that, in an ultimately digital world, say, I don't know, 10 years from now? 
where uh, more is digital, but not everything. But then what's with Miko's position therein? Uh, our vision from, from day one is to create a place for everyone to get equity and value for the information that they share. And if we continue to be successful on that mission, then it will be continuing to build the tools, the capabilities to make uh, that possible and also to limit the trade-off that people need to make every day. What is um, a wonderful, convenient, hyper-connected digital society look like where my, my rights are respected and protected, I have legal recourse if something goes wrong, I understand who to reach out to if I need help, and if we can play a part in continuing the innovation and the evolution of our tool set to contribute to that, then then I'll be um, an even happier, even older um, woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's see. <laughs> Are there any challenges that you see along that way for Miko in the coming years? Every day, every single day, <laughs> every day, because because we're inventing, um, you know, I, I guess those those challenges are the same. I often say I think we're facing a lot of the same challenges that um, people faced, you know, first moving to cities and, um, you know, around the emergence of the industrial era, you know, if you've only ever ridden a horse and all of a sudden there are cars and now you need roads and you need garages. OK, now you need insurance and now you need laws and now you need to work out when something has gone right or when something has gone wrong. And so we're kind of just doing that all over again, but within a digital context. And what gives me hope, despite the fact that every day there are you know, different kinds of challenges is, is that we found a way for society to evolve. You know, we, we worked out how to build roads and road rules and and um, how initially to come together and, and, and form a collective fund, um, which was sort of the emergence of mutuals or insurance to make sure that if something happened, people were protected. So we've done it before. We were also able to work out um, a Bill of Rights with regards to um, uh, each other as humans and whilst I, I recognise that's not respected or necessarily adopted everywhere in the world, it is universally recognised that as humans we have those rights. As we move towards the digital, um, it's an extension of that and so I think we will continue to have those conversations. But the past has shown us that that whole new world can emerge and be different despite the challenges. Um, so I imagine we will do that again. It's just that we will have flying cars this time, which will be a whole lot more fun. Let's see when that happens. <laughs> um, I have a question uh, jumping in there um, when we think about the utopia, uh, including flying cars. So I imagine this film poster and it says, uh, you know, a new sci-fi movie, and it it says um, directed by Miko, starring Katrina and Jason. What would be a working title for that movie? Oh wow! Okay, there's a question I've never had before. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> oh, what would be an aspect that would be important there? I wonder. Uh, look, I'll pick up on a thread and, and, and Jason, give you a couple of seconds so that your answer will be much more clever than mine. <laughs> I, I think you, you said utopia. I, I don't think it will be utopia. I think I think we will have many challenges as, as we work through things. Um, but I think uh, there was a, a blog post that I wrote um, some years ago, maybe five years ago now, which, which I think was called Seatbelt, Cigarettes and Data. And, and in that I reflected on a child, you know, our first car didn't have seatbelts, right? Um, uh, I used to go into after school care and um, it was not uncommon for, for the person that was taking care of me to go and ask me to go and buy a packet of cigarettes, you know, uh, and, it, you know, I wasn't, I couldn't even reach the counter, right? <laughs> Um, and the, you know, and by the way, when my mother found out, she was horrified and immediately changed, uh, changed who was taking care of me. But, 
the point of that was was that paradigm um, of not having a seatbelt evolved, right? Um, the idea of um, regulation around, you know, cigarette advertising and children and all of those things, you know, evolved during the course of, of and so I think, I don't think it will be a utopia, but I do think what we can imagine is a future where people that care about that change will continue to care, you know, whoever invented the seatbelt, whoever thought that it was good to protect children from what they can and can't purchase. There will always be people that will be dedicated to trying to find um, a way that works for everyone. Um, and, and I would hope that, yeah, we're part of that. Jason? Uh, well, I've had a, <clears throat> a longer time to think about this. I think Trust Me would be the title. Yeah. And, I, and I think that on a number of levels. One, because um, we probably are moving to a more decentralized world in the future and trust becomes quite a critical factor there. Um, but I also think from an organizational perspective, we've lost trust in organizations. And so this new paradigm that we're talking about, I think will enable people to, to trust organizations a lot more because they're in control of their data. So it becomes much more of an equal value exchange than it, than it is at the moment. Um, so either trust me or something around, you know, um, uh, some kind of equilibrium within the, between us and, and them, the corporations. Great. Thank you. I, I promise no, no more spontaneous <laughs> questions that difficult, <laughs> but I totally see the movie poster now. Thank you. Back to you, Ray. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, from my side, um, I'm, I'm done with my questions. Is there anything you would like to add that we haven't touched upon? The only thing I would add is that a lot of the things we're talking about, whilst we've, we've touched on the past and we've touched on the future, the most important thing is the here and now. And there are um, right now the tools and the um, techno legal regulatory environment for these solutions to be emerging. Um, we've developed um, a developer portal um, which provides access to those tools uh, so that people can start to think of the problems they want to solve. And I, and I think the most important thing is we're not, we're not, whilst we're future focused and our roadmap is informed by what might be, um, what's more important is that that future is actually right here and now. And, and that, that change that we want to see, um, you know, we're working with amazing founders and organizations um, in different parts of the world that are driving that forward right now. And, and I think, I think Jason, that's the important thing. Yeah, th this is, this is not something that is um, uh, going to happen. W what we see is that this is something that is happening in right now. Yeah, and I think this is something that has to develop over time as well. This is not uh, something that's already ready. Um, a lot of organizations obviously are working in this field uh, and hand in hand with regulation. This is something that develops over time. Um, but I believe you offer a very uh, nice, great, uh, like a beautiful do good initiative for uh, giving people access over their data and having them control it rather than just giving it away. I think especially now this is really important because we've seen many trust issues uh, arise over the years. Um, I would like to thank you very much for talking about Mikotos today. Um, Jason, Esther, is there anything you would like to add or ask? No. Nothing to add, but uh, thank, thank you. And uh, I'm really impressed by uh, how you explain your view on this and also the cases you explained to us that Miko is involved in. Um, you do come across like you are in there with your, with your whole heart um, and that they are very meaningful to you as they are to to me to society to us and I, i'm really impressed thank you very much for sharing thank you thank you for asking us yeah thank you so much for being here today we will post a recording on our channel uh, shortly after also the narrative uh, and i will give you a heads up on when that's out um so um, from my side, uh, that's it. Uh, although I do like to point out that uh, I think last time you mentioned um, that you put out a legal document a while back, 
uh, and would like to uh, ask us uh, from the consortium side for some uh, advice and to have a look over it or to promote it. I'm not sure if you uh, sure. have this top of mind already. Uh -huh. Yes, so um, uh, it's quite simply um, if you visit our website forward slash data, but we will send you a link. Um, what we did was uh, last year, uh, it's almost a year, so I think it was May last year we published it. So as you know, in February, the EU data strategy was published. I think it was around the 19th of February last year. Um, we stepped back and we looked at that document um, and then we imagined um, an additional data space that was dedicated to the citizen in all the roles that we have, citizen, patient, student, um, uh, consumer, employee, employer. Uh, and then from that perspective, uh, we looked at the use cases that would enable that to be possible within the context of the EU data strategy. So it's a bit of a summary of the EU data strategy, but it includes six use cases, some of them real that we've talked about today, um, and one last use case that's very future focused, um, but all giving examples of, of that, um, that pathway forward. Uh, and the other thing that we do in the paper is we look at what some of the barriers are to the things we've discussed today being possible. And we also look at some of the things that the EU could do to accelerate the market, whether or not that's around regulation or some of the initiatives like this that are being taken that actually help away, raise awareness or remove some of the barriers to, to people getting started. So. Yeah, that's nice. That makes it a bit more tangible than just uh, yeah. you know, regulations. It's hard to wrap your head around what that will actually mean for organizations. Yeah. So uh, thank you for putting that out there. So I've shared it in the uh, chat channel, so you should be able to. Yeah, um, I saw that pop up. Yes. Thank you for that. I think from our side, uh, that's it. We will keep you posted on when the interview is live and when the narrative is there. Um, so thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, much appreciated.